This is the Doc Psychology Podcast with Lynn Bokey, Todd Langston, and Art Ortiz. All right, here we are with episode three. I can't believe we're already on episode three. We've made it this far. Man, we just made it really far, didn't we? All right, so today we're going to be talking about how to get started in dog psychology. A lot of us got started very differently. Uh, but I think, you know, when people who are interested in dog psychology, they want to know, they want to learn more. So how do we get started, Lynn? How do we get started? <laughs> well, not get started, but how do we, if people want to learn, dig deep into the, the idea of dog psychology, what, how should people get started? Well, I think that first you have to decide what it is that you want out of it. Are you just curious uh, about it do you, or do you want to go and make a dog lay on its side? Uh, and which is still the wrong reason to start dog psychology. I think it really starts with the, the reason that you want to do it. And what's the reason sh people should, why is the, why, why should people start with dog psychology? Well, it is, it is exactly understanding how to communicate with a dog. Mo obedience, there's nothing wrong with obedience. Again, if we look at the, the, even Caesar's order, uh, you know, uh, energy, then dog psychology, then dog training, right? Uh, I've got a longer list, but dog training is down the line. And most dog training is just conditioning a dog to physically do something, whether it's a sit, stay, come, heal, or a shake, roll over, play dead, speak. Uh, they're basically tricks, but they're conditioned reactions to a human word. So we bypass the dog's language is the whole reason why my course in the very beginning, way back in the day, you're not allowed to speak because I need you to understand from a dog's point of view, the, you know, the dog's born with its nose open first. We talk about 60% of its truth comes from its olfactory system. And then 15% of its truth comes from the eyes. They well, 21 days later, the eyes open and then down, uh, is it two more weeks that the ears open? Well, we're backwards. You know, our ears open first so we can hear what's going on and then our our eyes open and it's down the line before a, a, a kid has any understanding that it can smell right way down the line and then our vocal cords start to bang around like a banjo and then all the things that we've been hearing we're now repeating but it's a, a garbled bunch of words that that only mom can translate for the first <laughs> year. All right. So that's what I, my intention was, was to stop talking. The main thing was to understand how difficult it is to give up your, you know, main form of communication to give that up and understand how difficult it is for a dog to try and what the fuck? I don't understand what you are saying there. What, what's this language you're talking? They have no ability to understand human language. I don't care that they can sit when you say the word, they can't spell it. They can't say it. They can't define it, that, that it doesn't exist. It's just a, uh, a reaction that's been conditioned. So I wanted people to find how difficult it was to communicate. You got to go to the bathroom. You need to explain that to me without saying you got to go to the bathroom, you know, and, and I would constantly test everybody. My point is, is that uh, dog psychology is understanding the dog's way of seeing the world. And when you understand that at its deepest level, you'll find, I mean, I only do words with my dogs just for the heck of it, because I can't shut yeah. the fuck up. I don't need to speak. I, I find myself now going, mm -hmm. you know, when I'm disagreeing with something that they're getting ready to do. <clears throat> It just and it, they look so then then they get their information well, but that's but that's dog psychology just understanding how those two how you can connect that to something right the the the, asso the association of how their brain works and and you know you, you like to go deep into it and from uh you know a, a way people complicate it is it's just the way that their brain has a memory it's an associative memory it's not episodic so meaning dog. it can't reach it's not retrieving. It has to be present. There has to be something triggering this memory in, in to, for this to work and understanding like, I, you know, speaking with somebody today that if you do choose this conversation, if you want to come in from the ears all the time, then you're going to end up with a dog that's constantly alert. 
and you're giving this direction to do something that requires some calmness, but you've done this conditioning of alertness. And because the ears are connected to the nervous system, they kind of but, feel. But that's that's dog psychology at its core, yes. right? So that yes. to, the, to the question, it's it's getting people to, as you always would say, it's so easy, it's hard. Break down yourself to simplicity. It's it's getting to know simplicity to understand what's really happening because otherwise we just we project our complications onto them and it really is just simplicity. I, project all, I, have, I catch myself still projecting things towards my dogs all the time and I'm, uh, myself whatever mood i happen to be in before i walk in or whatever mood i'm in while i've been lost in my mind and then they i become aware of what's happening it's it's not uh it's difficult but it is very oh, i had a conversation with the computer yesterday that made blueberry walk out of the room you know, so she's like, oh, I don't like that voice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And she's like, fuck that. I'm out of here. And do, 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 do. Yeah. So you're, you're absolutely right. Um, what we're projecting, you know, it's, it's all about how we're feeling. And it's very important to check yourself before you wreck yourself. I just had to throw that in because I'm an ADHD rhymer. Uh, well, but, I, I know... I know that like Todd and, you know, some of, some of, our, of my mentors like Colleen had the advantage of mentoring under you, but when you had the pack, when you had that whole group, right? And so not everyone has that, that ability to do that today. You know, not even Caesar has the pack that he did back then, you know? So right. no yeah. one has the ability to learn the way you learn. So what are ways that people can learn nowadays without having that big pack? I mean, I think that's something that people, because again, that, that's not available anymore. It's the way it's it was back then. Available. But if you find the right person uh, to help you, uh, I use video all the time. I'll take people to dog parks. I, I used to did that a lot back then. I, I, I hated going to the dog. I loved the dog park. And, and I know it, it, it's become a cesspool and, and problematic, but I, I loved my dog park. Yeah. And I, you know, I can't go to dog parks because, oh God, 30 days from now, that's going to happen. Uh, 10 weeks. Oh, 30 seconds. Go, 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 go. I, I can just see, feel what's going to yeah. happen next. And sometimes and I you wish you didn't know, right? But sometimes, because I know you see, like, God, I wish I didn't know what was about to happen because you're, you're just, you're seeing it play out. Yeah. And, and back in the day, I used to be very forward with, you know, my knowledge. And uh, I, that's another story about uh, whether you should be a Caesar lesson that I've learned. I'll save that for another day. But I used to tell everybody everything, you know, uh, intervene. That dog's not having fun, you know, and it's just. People love that shit, by the way. Yeah, they, they, what do you mean he's not having fun? He keeps coming back. I'm like, for fuck's sake, he's, he's, he's going away. And here comes your dog. And now he's charging your dog. He's not coming back to play. He's trying to keep him away. And then I would get into arguments. So uh, I learned to keep stuff to myself. And, uh, but yes, taking people to dog parks, uh, lots of footage, video footage, and uh, just making sure that you have the right person to give you the correct information and, and hold you accountable to knowing this and that, not just a script. Yeah. Here, here in Dallas, Lynn and, and Todd, there's a, there's a bar that's actually like a dog park. And so they serve alcohol and food at this dog park. Okay. It's it. kind of happening everywhere, but this place has been for around here in Dallas for, I don't know, 10, 10 or more years. And so I used to take my employees there and I would pay them, you know, as part of like their, their ongoing, ongoing education, I would take them there and we would get drinks, we'd get food, but we wouldn't take any dogs. We would sit outside and we would watch as the packs were starting to form within the dog park. And we would sit outside and we would, we would see as the energies would start to come in. And I would kind of narrate when this dog comes in, this is what's going to happen. And I, I, we could narrate I could figure out that dog is going to go after that dog as soon as the dog comes in because you can kind of see what's playing out and yeah. sure enough, it would happen. And so, you know, and those are some, some of the things that how you can still learn, but you have to have a good foundation of what it is, what dog psychology is, and then starting to apply it. But I think the best way to learn personally is like we talked about last episode is getting your hands on many dogs as possible. Absolutely. Well, that That's, is, that is, is by far the best experience. Well, yeah. Wait, you be careful. You just don't, well, well, here's the thing: Lynn is going to be missing. You don't want to send people out to get hurt because just touching dogs, a lot of people get hurt. But it's absolutely 
a value, one of the most valuable ways to learn, but you have to know what, okay, this didn't work. What will work? You have to have stuff to put into place. If it's not working, if you don't know, just touching dogs is, is not going to be beneficial. You, the, so I had a, I have a student right now for two more days. So it's just a three day thing. I do a pretty simple, uh, we do a, a small pack walk in the morning, you know, so there's, I think we had five dogs this morning and then a, do a walk through the woods. So now there's, you know, things happening through that and dialogue during these times. Uh, then they sit in on an appointment and then I do video. So it goes from seven in the morning until one, that's it. And it's, so it's, it's, it's in that simple order and it's kind of the, the, what I see foundationally that let's talk about, I think is I'm sometimes easier to prevent mistakes, right? So there's certain things to avoid. And one of the, the common themes now is work with as many people as you can. And this is even what they'll say. And, and then what I find is you, you're easily confused because the next sage that you meet changes everything that you learned from the last sage that you thought that you knew, right? And so th these people seem a little vulnerable to the people that have been doing it long enough to have a reputation. And so if they meet you and, they, and they're into you for that moment, everything you say becomes their new reality. And so they meet the next person that says things slightly different. And then that becomes their new reality. You can and see it in what, their posts. Well, you see it. Well, you not only that, you see, you know, <laughs> you see it in the, the, the way they work the dog. Cause you can, what knowing this over time, you can see all these different elements of different trainers. And what I encourage people to do is I call it, you got to find a religion. I mean, yes. you have to find either the way a human delivers it and has this way of thinking about it and own every aspect of that religion. And what I think I want to share with people is I'm in a position that's relatively high up in this world, but I've only worked with two people. I've literally, I've never been to a workshop. I don't crack a book. It's you and Caesar. So more isn't better. No. You have to, you have to anchor more, uh, whatever your belief is into one thing and then it makes it easier to go and pull all this information from different people because then you're, you're you have this rock it's and basically we all share this religion but we're different preachers yeah. and and that, that's why we work because we honor the religion and most trainers struggle because they don't so their egos are competing against you so i'm not saying our egos won't do that but i think the, the, the missing element I've seen in my experience, and I think it's relatively good experience over time, is that's what's missing. And, and we're just all going to be like names. It's like names on, a, on a, a, like a, a bucket list of working with trainers. It's like, oh, I have the notches on the bedpost, but what does that mean? So yeah. I think you need to anchor it and then go out there. And Yoa was a great example of I, I went and watched it on YouTube, and then I went and touched the dog, and then I'd watch it on YouTube, and then I'd go and touch the dog. And I think that's a great way. When I entered your pack, my wife had bought me a book on body language and how to read dogs. And I read it cover to cover multiple times. And that was the single greatest thing outside of then the information that came in because it advanced me. It put me in a position of having visual knowledge of things being said. And then you brought context to it. That's the problem. Right? So I'd be like, oh, yeah, okay. That, I kind of, oh, that, that has a meaning. And, and so it was, it was developed in that, okay, I see it. And then now he, this is how he's doing it. All right. Then he did this and then, okay, now you can see that. It's like, you were talking about art, the pattern thing, like that ability to see patterns. But I think there's kind of a textbook way you can go about doing this. I think you can literally learn the language. I think you can take the language into groups of dogs in differing ways. I think you can see how people deliver the message. And after enough, what? 50 appointments you more or less have seen everything right i mean it starts to vary but it's like working in a restaurant you're making shit up the first week you work there and then you really start to know the menu and and that's what i think is missing but what's happening is everybody's going out there and they're pulling all these little tidbits of information from all these people and their mind is diluted and the, and the dog senses the lack of commitment to approach right so regardless of the way that's used it's a diluted intention and it doesn't work so you mean you can't go to a workshop and be a dog psychologist? Is that what you're Fuck saying? me, right? Yeah. That's, the, that's the part that I, I can't understand. It's like, yeah, like you one. said, Lynn, I had 45 days direct student time with you and then and some time working with you and working for And that almost seems like it should be a bare minimum. Well, that's what, um, I, that's what I was trying to achieve. I mean, that's the why the, the first 10 days you can't speak. I want you to get rid of everything really? you think you know. I don't want, look, I don't want you to lose everything you know from somebody else that you, you respect. 
I want you to shut up while you're trying to learn from me. I don't need to hear what that person taught you. I, if you want to spend your money <laughs> to tell me what you learned from somebody else, it's your time. We don't have much of it. So TikTok, shut the fuck up or I'll sit back and I'll just uh, listen to you. And then I'll go, okay, great. I don't know what we're going to do today now because you took all, of this, all the time. That is the thing. You can learn from as many people as you want, but go in. I mean, Bruce Lee, go in with an empty cup, you know, fill it up with that mentor. And then when you go home, if you've done it properly, you can sift through what that mentor you really like and what really sticks with you and what your other mentors, and you can start to make something that is a hybrid. But until you, that's, that's another thing. Everything that I, I'm not trying to preach myself, but everything that I do has a specific reason. Learn, practice, master, begin again. Go learn, practice, master, whoever first, then go begin again. And then you just grow, 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 grow. And one last thing on myself, what you were saying about putting everything in categories, I've done that finally. I've everything is in, and I call it the pressure matrix, but we won't get into that. But every single thing that you need to know is done for you. It's like a map and then all these posts, guideposts. So I'm at this guidepost. I know where I need to be and I know where I am and where I've come from and I know what's going to happen. I've got it all worked out and you're right. I believe that there needs to be something, but, and it's tough because there are, so it's funny. It's dog. So, hold on, Lynn. <laughs> so Art, you took a different path, right? So your path is different. It, um, you shared it yesterday. Obviously there's like personal elements. We all have that involved. What part of your path do you think was the most beneficial? Like I can articulate, certain aspects of what Lynn offered me, right? I know you worked with Lynn, but later, like his, so his dialogue isn't part of who you were at the beginning. Yeah. Right. So what, like what early on do you think was the most beneficial? What part? 100% without any question, Colleen, because like I'm, in what just living, living the life, like living in her house and living the life. I was immersed in it. It was my religion. Like you said, you know, I, I woke up to it. I slept to it. You know, and that's all I did. And I got to go to appointments with her. I got to see how she worked with clients. And that was in itself was worth its, I mean, I didn't pay for anything, but uh, I get chills thinking about it because I just remember how she would work and, and talk to the clients. And then I would see how she could, you know, get results and stuff like that. And, and then, you know, her being a female, you yep. know, and kind of coming in there, you know, very confidently and things like that. And like you mentioned previously in the other episode, like, cause she just, like, she just doesn't really care. Not that she doesn't care, but she has this way about her. Um, but just she, to, I, one of the women trainers that can pull confidence off to perfection. Yeah. And, and in my opinion, it's, it's a, a good roadmap. I think she's a good roadmap uh, for trainers. And I think she's a good roadmap if you're, if you're a female trainer and maybe having a hard time identifying with the males that are teaching out there. And, and she was hard on me too. Like she was, she didn't take, she didn't take it easy. She was like, Oh, right, it's okay. No, she was like, this is what right. I expect. This is what I want you to do. You know, and she didn't candy coat, it, candy coat anything like, and, and she would even correct me because I remember, uh, you know, this was kind of in the early days of, you know, of what pressure was. Right. Um, and so anytime I would say, okay, so I'm going to apply tension. She's like, no, 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 you're going to apply pressure. She made sure that I said the right words that I was. That's, very Lynn, that's, that's Lynn talking out of her. Right I know. Yeah. And she uh, was the a, words you choose or the emotions you use, you know, that's right. So <laughs> that's become things, you know, I, I'm a go for it. E jar, right? And, uh, but uh, she, I was laughing earlier because she was a, uh, a, a tough one to reel in and because and, uh, she has her own way of being and she was constantly late. I had to tell her, you're late one more time. I'm, I'm out of here. And she would pull in the parking lot late. And I'm, we're driving by. See you later. She was a tough one to reel in, but uh, she is uh, very good. And I'm glad I, I've never heard anybody say the things that she's done with them. I, I love that she was tough on you um, because it's necessary. It, people think, oh, you got to be nice to people. No, no, you don't. If I'm nice to you, then you're not going to learn anything. I'm not going out of my way to be mean. I just don't have time to be either one. We would be able to get uh, comments and read comments from students. And she, she always intimidated a, a good amount of female students. They don't know how to take her. 
Her yeah. confidence is is confusing, I think, to them because it it it's very clean, like it's it comes off very clean, and it's not easy to do. It you know, she's like that, and boy, so she kind of was like one. Yeah, of but 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 for, but not. But you don't look and go tomboy. No, you know, right. you know that that's a background once you get to know. Her, you but, hear Florida. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> no, she's but also, she doesn't get flustered when she gets stuck either. You know what I mean? Like, when, what's it, that? She doesn't get flustered or hurt. She never no, wavers. Never. You know what I mean? And so, like, she she'll like be like, I'll be like, oh god, like I feel like she's stuck, and she just goes through it. And like, remember that time in TCW? I don't want to bring this up too much, but remember that on the the treadmill thing at TCW, Todd, when you when the treadmill started to the band started moving, and do you remember I love that? that? That was that was great. Yeah, I do. I'm not gonna go into the whole detail, but like you could tell, like you were starting to get like, oh, I'm a little nervous. But you you did recover. But with with Colleen, like she like she never wavered from who she was. She, I'm gonna keep going. I'm gonna keep going. You know what I mean? And like her confidence never dropped. Like you know, so the I key, admire that about her. The key part of that, uh, which is how I I want people to see me make mistakes. You yeah. know, is uh, I don't want to be a you know some sort of a superhero that nobody can attain. I'll go out of my way to point out my mistakes so that uh, people can say, oh, okay, well, then I can do that too. No, this was a, a, a this was an equipment malfunction. Yeah. That, oh. that, that okay. just, so it was, it was a little different. It was, uh, it was Impl an equipment malfunction leading to failure. So it wasn't like my, my decision-making led to failure, which is more acceptable, which is more acceptable somehow to me. Uh, right. It was that there was this equipment malfunction and then it's more like, um, an optics thing you know it's like you're here you up on stage supposed to be this able to do this thing and this thing's happening and so i mean it doesn't change the you know the how it breaks down but yeah it was it i would have taken a whole made a whole lesson out of just the mechanics of the machine breaking down and why it shouldn't upset your confidence. well and you're, this was this was actually several years ago too so it was uh, quite a ways back yeah, I, I, I kind of miss Colleen. Well, to, to, our, our, to your point, I, I think the next part of anybody being good at this is what you said, is is immersing yourself in it. Like you can't have a dog and you just go out and do training appointments and really understand how to get two or three dogs together that don't agree with each other, right? But if you live it and you all you, you find yourself bringing hundreds of dogs over time, thousands of dogs into these dynamics where it's like for convenience, you know, you don't want to be – taking 10 dogs out one at a time yeah then I, the right. lessons that come from that just reinforce whatever you you learned and without that i don't think it's possible to really truly teach with honesty unless you've been in the middle you know you woke up at four in the morning a hundred times to deal with somebody else's dog and, and the follow-through it requires to to go in at, at three in the morning and do it right right uh yeah immersion Sink immersion Remember, yep. I used to say, I love the deep end because if I can survive the deep end, I can walk on water in the shallow end and still they will say I'm afraid of water. But, um, but that's uh, the, the way I love learning overwhelmed until you recover. You know, people, people don't do overwhelmed that well anymore. No, uh, no, they go the dogs that are going to overwhelm you and your client, you know, it's okay. If you don't want to do that, just work with different dogs. There's nothing wrong with not, I, some of my students would say, I never want to work with that aggressive dog ever. I'm like, great. You've done the highest level, right? Now you can do anything I, with other dogs. I parrot that. I parrot that, by the way. He does. I'm in fact making sure I'm like, you can make an entire career out of working with puppies. <laughs> you have to pick your avenue, know your you limits. Know, Dr. Ian the thing that, it, this is another thing I think is a good time to talk about. And you guys, I'd love to know your, your take on this. I don't think you can be taught to work with aggression. No, no. I think I think there's some there's some weirdness and there's some innateness that makes you want to do it, and then you learn strategies. But but you can't be taught necessarily. And you did you took me through some things that I mean I look back now and I go like like go move that dog. I'm like what? Go move it because it's not going to want to move out of your way. Go move it. You're like fuck. Yeah. Okay. Right. And so, so that you, that's, those are the moments that you're either going to, you, you, you gather that and you do it or not. I had, I had a trainer here that, that she came for the implicit purpose of aggression. And I had a small dog. This dog was this like five pound chihuahua. And at the time, my daughter, I think was six. 
five or six. And and this dog, although it was one of these bit everybody dogs, this dog was like cut. Like my, my daughter at the time controlled this dog. All right. And so it was this interesting dynamic. And this trainer shows up and we go on a few appointments with aggression. And she's a structured person. She's a good handler and a good trainer, but she's really structured. And you can tell mentally it has to have a certain order. I'm a little bit more freewheeling. And, you know, I walk into these appointments without a plan or anything like that. And, and, right. and it, was, it was overwhelming. But when I asked her to leash this dog up and she asked me if it was going to bite her and I said, yes, she started to cry. Oh, boy. And, and this is what I'm saying is I think inherently you have to have the ability to know where your trained ability or being taught ability stops and you just you don't don't mess with this area like when i told you to move that dog this uh is a great time for people in that kind of position this woman had a great opportunity as well uh the best time to practice a needed skill is when you don't need it and so you didn't need to have the skill because I was standing right there. Wait, wait, hold up, hold on. Say that again. That's yeah. a great one, by the way. It's another realism. The best time to practice a needed skill is when that skill is not needed. And that woman who started crying, the first thing she asked you was, is this dog going to bite me? Uh, and you said, yes, she started crying. I personally would have stopped everything right there and in disgust broke down everything right there because that's a kink in the hose. You should not of be course. doing anything else after uh, that. Uh, for, well, forward movement can only happen when the dog's yep. in right? right? So we had to stop and, and we have to go, okay, now you have to start going into this. And, you know, at the time, I don't know what conversation was said. I just remember the situation because the, the intention of her presence was aggression. And I think some people believe they need that skill set. And I think on some yeah. level, there needs to be knowledge of how to deal with it, but it does not mean it's a requirement. You do need to understand it. You do need to, and, and listen, years of, of teaching, I just did things my way, the way I would do them. And after getting all the student videos back again and again and again, and they were only, they weren't doing what I said to do. They were doing what they saw me do. I literally had to start asking clients to put a muzzle on a dog that I would never need a muzzle on so that my students could say, well, then he put a muzzle on a dog. So I guess I should put one on too. And so if you have the, the need, but not the ability or the confidence to work with an aggressive dog, put the muzzle on. If I had my way, all these people that do have muzzles on dogs, I would work with them in the muzzle because they're, they're flinching and running and getting out. Of, it's got a fucking muzzle on. That's the whole point. Take it, show the dog that you don't care. Right. It punches you. Yeah. That then will build confidence inside of you down the line. Again, the best time to practice a, a needed skills when it's not needed. I got a dog that's coming at me with no muzzle on, and I know what to do because I've done it so many times with a dog with a muzzle. Not me, but that's what you want to do with yourself if this is what you want to do. But I would not go, I mean, that was another thing too with my students, you know, as the first behavioral type of school, you know, dog psychology school. And so everybody, everybody that came through that, that course initially, went back to their hometown and always had like an interview with the newspaper or TV channel. And suddenly they're inundated with dogs before they're ready. And that's, it's very important to take the time after you learn what to do and, and how to do it and why to then practice it again. That was the whole point. You're coming to learn from me. You're going home to practice. And that's what you then you'll be mastering. Now what's happening is they're practicing with clients. Yes. So then, there is no practice phase of, of handling. There's there's a we go and we learn something and now we we go and we we're in a business. Well most of the, the uh most of the workshops out there are all about business with a little bit of dog stuff in there. This well, is how, okay, so this is for the people this. listening, this just happened to somebody I was speaking with, new trainer on the phone. They walk into an appointment. They know there's a dog that they've mentioned biting, but they haven't been real clear. And the trainer didn't ask enough questions. The dog was put away. So they op the guy goes, let's meet the dog. They open the door. The dog goes from where it was at to a beeline, launches himself, and takes the guy down by his face. Did he not listen to the client during the time the hold dog on, was Hold <laughs> on. He's, so I'm talking to a group of, of uh, trainers at the time, and I go, hey, dude. How big are you? And he goes, I think he's like 5'10". I go, how much do you weigh? And he's like 
220. I go, anybody out there smaller than that might have been completely rocked, potentially hospitalized or worse. I go, this dog just took down a 5'10", 220-pound guy in the face With because the these weapon. people are getting a few days of training, literally less than double-digit days, yeah. and they're and they're they're working, yeah. and they're and they're, they're training. They're building a business before they know how to run it, you know, um, or they're building a business of dogs before they understand dogs. And I, I get a lot of calls. I need to learn more, but I don't have time. Well, you got to make the time. Take advantage. Again, best time to practice a skill is when you don't need it. You've got a full business, right? Now's the time to just tell everybody they're on the list. They don't need to know that you're going to learn more. Yes, we have a three-month waiting list. Go and learn. Or, you know, uh, both Art and I now have an online program. I, I'm so tired of doing it. I mean, I love the five days, but it's not the same. I, the, my 30-day program was kind of taken away from me because people are in a hurry. And so nobody uh, would want to do that uh, again. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's crazy out there right now. What would be super cool is if we were able to create a situation where there was a location where we had a pack and we all just got to go use it. And the pack was handled by people that under Like some of the things you used to say that never made sense was that you used to let uh, students handle your dogs and then you always had to straighten them out. Well, like, I, I was like, I let them go out of balance. But I, it would be really cool because I do think – Ultimately, for people to really be educated, they need to be in dogs. I mean, they really do. But the reality is, is who wants to maintain what that takes, right? I mean, it's just not, it's not logistically viable for any one of us to do it. I mean, it's your job just becomes keeping dogs alive, not the students at that point. But to have like a team that could keep a pack really balanced that we could just go in and use, right? So we're able to take students and do whatever program we want to do with them at that and and use this pack for like like a superpower i mean imagine how how if we really concentrated an effort to keep 20 dogs balanced how balanced those 20 and then they since they're really only in my opinion you get what from age one to seven that they're really really good for that and then beyond that they're like fuck this <laughs> you know and, and like you can then home them out because they'd be so good anyways well, the problem with that, though, is having a completely balanced pack doesn't give the education on how to balance a pack. And that's I agree that you should have the pack that's balanced. But that's the that's that was my course. You're yeah, coming but, in. But even, a, even balanced dogs do shitty when people don't handle them well. Of course. Of course. They, so absolutely. Somebody you grabs your you know, grabs five dogs and they bust out and the dogs are smooth. Well, we know we got we got more of a student. We can go. All right. Let's make bigger plans for this person. But it's, that's I would love, and I've, I've battled this in my head, a pack. You know, I want to go back. To, I mean, I have four. Me but it's, not, it's not the same. I battle it. I miss but, it. Uh, I do. I, I don't want the responsibility, but I loved having them around. How many dogs you know, do you have, Todd? talked about that a lot, Art. You just had that conversation with me. Yeah, how many and dogs do so, you have, Todd? Four. And, Lynn, how many have now? I know sugar you added, so. Five now. Um, well, I have so five. Too. My last dog from anything to do with california tuxedo and, uh, yes he's always dressed for a party uh the other dogs they've never been never experienced any of that yeah that even, though, awesome. even though they are pack they still do pack things it's more of a pet pack than yeah. a working pack yeah. um, you know what's also interesting by the way you know with with your own pack so I, I have luna she's probably one of the oldest dogs we have we actually kind of put her in retirement because she was starting to get like almost it was almost not fair to her anymore to yeah. start introducing to all the dogs so uh when we started to uh bring in some dogs into our home towards like towards the end like when we right before we stopped doing it i actually stopped getting my dogs around all the all the other like client dogs just because why, why? They were over it they were over it why you did well, it they're not well i don't want to say that that's you're not wrong what, well, what they, happened, they were just over it they were just like already like why you know why can't we just do things together you know what i mean so i basically want to honor their you know last years together you know frankie passed away emma and hero passed away 
uh, in 2020. And then Frankie passed away this back uh, February. Frankie was like my, my number one dog of all time, you know, but uh, you know, we just started to, to get them not, we started, stop them from being around all the dogs just because I feel like they were kind of just over it. Like they were kind of telling me like enough is enough. You know what I mean? Like let's just let us hang out with the older dogs. They still have the, if they're good, like, like she is, they, they've got the, still the dominant level in the mind and they can yeah. benefit their dogs, but they don't have the physical agility and stamina. So they're still great to work in a pack. I just always would bring them in after the other dogs are much more, uh, yeah. Uh, reduced in the state of mind and the energy, I'm, physical I'm energy. Completely with you are. I, I, I get to a point where I'm like, fuck this. I've asked them to be around so much instability for oh, so yeah. long, you know, that it's like, nah. yeah. And I think that to me, I, uh, over time, I think they have a shelf life. I think there's really a solid shelf life. And then after a few years, I, I think they can still be a role it, model. They can, but in my experience, their ability to handle the instability changes. Right. And they become, become less um, patient with the instability as they age and they practice it more. You remember Blueberry or you remember Shelby? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I adopted her and I was trying to encourage any of the trainers to adopt her because I, I saw in her a perfectly working pack dog, like a dog that's going to, going to help you bring energies out. And she's been that to a T where she, she mm. has that, that, given gift of being able to use her kind of happy go lucky but there's almost an element of dominance covered up in there somewhere and it and it, and it plays perfectly to these dogs and you you know i nobody took her that so we it was a lot to get her out here but it was worth it she was the last one i brought in i haven't adopted a dog in a long time but it was good to also be a a, a, a student again to go through what people go through like adjusting a dog because her and, and mr pickles got in a fight within the first couple of days you over both. something I was, oh, that was food it was it was food and so to to be back in that oh, sh- oh fuck all right here we go now we got you know you having to like you said you got to be around instability to to cre- know how to stable it you know stabilize it and it was I, good it was a good remark but it was also like sorry go ahead i don't disagree with you guys about the shelf life i'm just saying that i'll work the younger pack without the older dogs until they're yeah. worn out a little bit or drained, and then I bring them in. But I bring dogs in to introduce, and Tuxedo, he's 16. He loves his job. I'll, you get, yeah, here it goes. Tuxedo's going to give you what for. He still yeah. loves his job, but I'm there. I, I understand. You guys are not wrong. You're absolutely right. I am just more. Hercules, come here. I'm I'll just more you. aware and, and, and uh, there for the dogs if they get overwhelmed. But I don't expect them to do an eight-hour shift. You're right; they get privileges. I mean, if you come into my house right now, you're like, "Who? You're not Lynn Boki. You, your dog. I've let my dogs get away with murder because I am just like the shelf life dogs you're talking about. I, I, I want to. I sometimes wish I didn't know dog psychology. I just want to be a silly human and and uh, cuddle with my dogs. Uh, but yeah. I do have the ability to switch it any any minute, and I have that information. But you're, you're right; they do have a, uh, a shelf life. They can't go on the ten mile hikes. You know, they can't do all that stuff. But they still have it in them to be a role model that they're they look the other ones can look up to. I put them in. Mr. There. Pickles has has been um, infallible. He has uh, the only dog over the years I've seen just flatline over time, not change one bit about being around all those unstable dogs. And he's just doesn't give a shit. Is that the deaf dog, Todd? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. He's deaf. And I mean, obviously that affects it some, but they're more peaceful. I've owned deaf dogs twice now over the last, I think, 10 ish years. And in both cases, that, you know, there's nothing to really stimulate them and, and very little nervousness. And so they're real stable and they're good teachers because, you know, it's, it's good to, to get people because it's easy for people to not talk you know when they know the dog can't hear now but the first thing people do oh the first thing they'll just feel bad but emotion yeah it, yeah they're great they're super easy uh never i had, lose him never had, a dog. had blind ones but never no never see, to me having a blind dog and maybe it's just because i could i see myself being able to be deaf but i i can't picture blindness that's kind of a weird thing to say in itself I would but trapped yeah 
And so I can't to having a blind dog would be very uncomfortable for I watched uh, Jojo's dog uh, uh, while she was here and, and her dog was blind and it made me uncomfortable <laughs> what to be honest with you the way it moved around and stuff Maya. like I'm very sensitive to absorbing energy and dogs that move around blind I'm sort of like well, once kind they of get get hold of everything they they're actually you don't even know they're blind yeah you, I know that but see these dogs when they come here they're new to my environment uh, so yeah. I don't have I don't have the conditioning of owning a, a blind dog long enough to see that they don't they don't have the reaction of slowness and that hesitation of trying to smell their way through something and feel the objects in front of them. Can I real quick? Uh, uh, the last episode I was talking about a student that was deaf, and I ran through and I don't believe that I I explained. Uh, I feel like I, I sounded like I didn't like deaf people. That was not the reason I sent her home because she was deaf. I sent her home because she was causing fights and, and, and everybody getting hurt because she was deaf and not willing to admit it. I have no problem with people being deaf. I, I, I just want to make sure that, that uh, you understand that it was not about her being deaf uh, that I fired her. It was about her anyway. Not being able to hear the, the, the interactions that are happening behind. I, I would have, I would have loved to have had a deaf person uh, at the school that was fully in, immersed in being deaf. I would have enjoyed that, but we had too much struggle getting her to even say that she had a hearing issue, and that was causing problems with the dogs and the fights. And how did you communicate with her? Uh, <laughs> it was very difficult, and it was it, it, it was very difficult. And her, she wouldn't do her homework. It was just because she wrote like, uh, like she was deaf. I mean, big words, little letters, big, it was, and it would only be, uh, half of the page. And it just, what it just wasn't working because we couldn't get past that one thing. If she just said, I am deaf and I don't know what to do about it. I would have brought her into the fold. And there is no great to learn and without surrender it's impossible to teach and impossible. i told you guys that uh, resistance is important once the resistance ends the education begins but we didn't have time for that type of resistance yeah. because it was very dangerous i had a lot of lawn mowers with four paws running around Dude, your pack was so fucked up there were so many dogs in that pack that were like serious dogs yeah they are. i mean i mean one after another i mean it's like okay so if a fight starts look at the backside because so what's your name? Some little shepherd mix is going to come hauling us in and bite your ass. As yeah, fast. I was going to ask you if you remembered that dog that bit you in the calf. Well, is she uh, gonna... then, these two, this satellite fight's going to break up over here. You're gonna get, we're just going to start fighting because it's Saturday and these dogs got set off and, and then you got to look out. So but I'm going to come in and do this. And I still explain like after a, a fight and you, it would be broken up. And I remember the roles too. And I, I think I did a post on that. I mean, you had to have a, like you were, you were the center. Right. And then I would be the, I would be defense. So I would be blocking the dogs from coming in and adding to the fight. And you, you would be in the middle of the that I allowed fight. to do that, by the way. What's and that? You were the only student that I allowed to be involved during the fights. Um, well, I mean, but thank you. And that's that's, you know, it, those lessons were kind of priceless. But then after you would break it up and, and you would get everybody to surrender then all the dogs would circle that area like it was a trough of food and spend three or four minutes. Yeah. Well, sitting there. Take bell and the experience in of the aftermath. Were you there the day that I, I had that uh, uh, St. Bernard, the uh, Rottweiler and a pit bull, and I had St. Bernard up on the wall, and I had the pit bull and this arm off the ground, and I was kicking the Rottweiler away. After that fight, you could see the dogs, they were smelling I, I, the submission. They were smelling the submission mm -hmm. and, and the, they would all, they would start to climb up the wall all the way, all the way up to as far as they could where that, uh, uh, St. Bernard was, it's just very stuff like that. You can't get in an, in a I was, I don't think I was, I was, I don't believe I was there then. What I remember though, is a story. And I think it was the St. Bernard is that he bit my there penis. was another student that was there would you, named Tina. Or some little lady, some older lady that was tiny. She was like a hundred pounds. Like yeah. And she was that she had the St. Bernard and it started fence fighting and she tried to correct it and it attacked her. She got torn up pretty You bad. said that they said it thought it was a mountain lion attack in the hospital. Yeah. yeah. And I, so I was at a when I was in France, I was in a rescue because I was taken there by the student that I was with. And this rescue had dogs that were <laughs> dude. 
it, they were so wound up. It was it was monumental the level they were. So we went into this kennel and we took out this big shaggy dog and she started walking it down this walkway and it started bouncing back and forth to fence fight everybody and she went in to correct it. I'm like, hey, don't even think about it. I go, we're getting out of here. Move, because, move. Oh, yeah, move. <laughs> Lynn move. Her word. I, move. I, Lynn came out. I was like, get out of here. It's, and, a, it's rule number five. Move. What's rule number Goldilocks. five? What would Goldilocks do? You know, she would Goldilocks that shit and find where it's just right. Get out of the fire. It's too hot for you. She was going to get wrecked hey. by just a dog that was wound up out of its mind, not aggressive in any way, shape, or form, but she was going to get destroyed. Oh, neat. A wood chipper. I wonder what it looks like inside. All right. Just stick your head down. In there. And like the what you're saying, this, this lady trying to deal with a fence fighting dog and ends up just wrecked. Awesome. That's an interesting story, though. With Debbie was her name. She was Debbie. awesome. I I've still got she all. Was. Of it. She was cool. Well, this is a little five foot one. You know, five foot two. Just she was older. She's like my age now at that time. So like fifty five. And back in the day, you know, uh, towards the end of a student's course, I would give them the privilege to be in control of the entire pack while I go to dinner. Nobody didn't do that until after like the first three weeks. And it was always a really good thing for them, their confidence that they are controlling the pack and doing the things. They, they obviously couldn't do all the stuff. They had to take them out a few at a time, the ones that were on the list. But when they called me at dinner and told me that Debbie was attacked, uh, I could only hear in the background, you're not going to kick me out, are you? You're not going to kick me out. And I get to the, no, I'm not going to kick you out. I get to the facility to check on her. And you're not going to kick me out, are you? And it reminded me so much of when I was in the Marine Corps and we had to do crossovers and they pull somebody off the bottom of the pool and they pump their stomach and, and the water. <laughs> I didn't quit. I didn't quit. I love that about her. And so she goes, what do I tell them at the hospital? Because if you tell somebody you got bitten, they, they quarantine the dog. And I said, well, I can't tell you what to say, but I can tell you what I have said and what other students have said. And that is, I was walking my dog and another dog off leash came and attacked my dog and I tried to break it up and it bit me. And when she gave that story, they asked her, are you sure it wasn't a mountain lion? This is the dog that bit my penis, right? I, <laughs> that, it, it, oh my God, I still have the scar on the head of my penis from that dog. <laughs> and, and that was over 20 years ago, right? Well, almost 20 years ago. but. Uh, Oh my God, that dog was so powerful. You should get an OnlyFans and post it on there. I'm just kidding. Don't do that. <laughs> Check out Lynn's head scar. <laughs> awesome. Well, this is an awesome episode. Um, any, oh, last, any, last thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> any last thoughts? Any last thoughts, Lynn? Todd? As far as getting started in dog psychology, you really want to make sure you understand what you want, research everybody that that you can, that you want to learn from. Obviously people are going to be looking at money and you know, I get it. I, I, I understand that. Uh, but look at it anyway, because some people are charging as much as I do and they don't even have a quarter of the understanding because that's what people do in business. So don't get wrapped around the hype of a certain person or, or what you've heard about them. It, you know, if you dig deeper, you'll most likely find it's the the uh, the king's new wardrobe. You know where he he's you know that story. The yeah yeah they they're just people of know that that individual or individuals and they talk about them. It doesn't mean that they know what they're doing. Look at everybody, look at everybody, and then make your decision and understand it's an investment. No matter what, no matter if you get the cheaper person or you get the most expensive person. I don't care uh, so much about the money. We all need money. I care about the time and effort you put into uh, learning and maintaining and growing in your understanding of dog psychology. I can give a shit about my name on your resume. I only care about people who want to really, really understand it at its deepest level and apply it at its deepest level and, and grow from there. I hope that made sense. What do you got, Todd? 
You know, I think um, there's things that people can learn before they go in and start digging into the dog psychology that's helpful. You know, I rely a lot on my behavioral understanding just of behavior, right? So I did a post saying that I think three things that can be really helpful is understanding primal human, right? So study anthropology, flip through some books on anthropology to see what the the primal motivation of us as humans are, right? So you can understand somebody asked, why do dogs hesitate around men more? Well, what's the primal motivation of a male versus a female, right? There are primal reasons we exist. This is not culturally influenced. This is primal survival biological influences, right? So it helps you understand why certain things are happening in the understanding of things. And I think another one that is extremely helpful is sociology. Yeah. Um, I was on a, a conference call with a guy named Kurt Greenwald. He's like, um, he's a, like a new, better looking crocodile hunter. Right. And he's fant- It's just an, this amazing guy from South Africa. He lives in an area where he, he basically does what we do, but with lion prides. So he has a fucking, he looks like you, right? lion. He, it's that guy that looks like you. Yeah. He's yeah. Got, yeah. That guy's amazing. Okay, so I was on a conference call with that guy, and he said something that I've said before, and it was like this cool reinforcement that all social groups live by the same social code. And I think this is something people don't really look at enough, but I rely on it tremendously, is that sociology is a natural survival base in our instinct, and it's why groups do what they do. It's why aloofness is present in dominance and not in the back of it, right? So it, it, it exists for reasons and there's things that happen because of those things, right? And then if you can take psychology, sociology, and anthropology and understand the way that behavior is motivated and the way that the simplicity of behavior works, if you would then add this species dog, it's not that challenging because you're really then going, okay, let's look at how to read it. And I came into this with this knowledge. You know, I came into it with the knowledge of psychology and sociology. I, I've, I've always been very intrigued by behavior. So then I was just introduced to the way the dog world worked, but it, it had a reference to me because I understood groups of humans. I understood the, uh, the way that associations worked. So to me, that's helpful starting points for people in addition to obviously what we talked about. But that would be where I'd like to add. Right? That's social pressure. That's in the pressure matrix. It's a very important. You're exactly right. Being social is understanding that is critical because you're working. Social with- dynamic is motivated by certain things that we all have. And it doesn't just, you don't just have to be a human to know why a family has to exist for survival to happen and what roles everybody takes in this family and how lessons are taught and what behavior modeling is about and so forth. I mean, it's, it's the, premise of what we do we're just adding dogs to it we're just referencing dogs in our conversations as opposed to a different species it's been a long time since we've actually gotten together but everything i uh, half the stuff i show videos doesn't have anything to do with dogs it's the same everything's exactly the same while remaining complete or while being completely different at the same time but wait a second you talked to that guy with the lions yeah how did that happen? Because I would love to go down there and, and enter lions. Are uh, well, the, this, they actually arranged that as well. I don't know if I, I, I haven't added it to myself to be a part of that. Yeah, he's being used to help this uh, this group of trainers that I work with. And so he he's just part of what they, they're bringing in. And so he was on a conference call. What was interesting is nobody really even knew what to ask him. And so I, I asked him a couple. I was the only one that asked questions. And I asked him. Um, this was Abraham's how, group? What did I ask? Yeah. And, and it was, um, I forget what it was, but it was in re- reference to a, imprinting a correction. Cause he had mentioned that they do a certain thing with the lions to discourage something. And I was like, I heard imprint. Pepper spray. And so I, I asked an imprint question and then I asked him something else, but he referenced, you can't even go in with a limp. Dude, your stomach can't oh. hurt. They oh. will tolerate any weakness. They'll take it down and they're in their tame, but your weakness will be jumped on. And, and so it was instinctual. It, it, that all social because he works with all these animals he goes all social mammals live by the same code it it is exactly that's amazing i would love to to talk with that guy meet that guy work with that guy i saw him so many years ago just before they were going to close down his you know sanctuary or whatever it was and he had to raise money like before uh crowdfunding it was way back in the day and i was blown away by this guy 
the things that he he does. I saw him have to break, you know, when you're introducing two dogs and he's introducing two lions. I watched, man, this before I could pull. So he, he was raised on a, a reserve, a nature reserve. And since he was raised on it, he was, as a child, it's like when you learn other languages as a child, he was raised with animals, all these different species of animals. And so I only can make the assumption that he just absorbed all of this. You that know, sounds familiar. The, yeah. Yeah. Kind of, yeah. And so profound he he goes you guys have to come to my where i live to my land he goes my i have i live on ancient land he goes there's a cave on my property that has a man mummified that's like five or six thousand years old still in the cave the energy of my land is tangible because you can feel the energy of my no and i was like holy smokes that's crazy i just got chills i want to go let's do it let's let's do a, a let's do a uh what'd you say i said i tell good stories yes <laughs> like, i got <laughs> Do a, uh, what do they call that in school? Field trip, dog psychology field trip and go and, and, uh, do podcasts over there. Yeah. That guy is amazing. When I saw him yeah. introducing two lions and he uses the nose type of thing too. And he, he didn't like psh, the pepper spray psh, just enough yeah. to get the, the lion's yeah. attention. And then they stopped the fighting. He, they, they start doing that. He said when they're cubs. They start mm -hmm. doing this nose correction. And that's what I, that's what I asked. I go, oh, we call, that's an imprint. I go, so the first time I correct a dog is the most important. And I go, is that kind of what you're describing to me? It sounds like is it, you're imprinting this, what I would consider this is a stop mechanism. And yeah. he was like, oh, and it starts going into it. Cool. He was nice. Cool guy. Amazing. Amazing. I want to meet him. I want to, let's do it. Serious. All right. Well, cool. Add art. Tell us. Tell us what you want, brother. Um, I just think that you know people need to be open to uh, learning these things. You know, I just started recently started learning jujitsu. Now, uh, just because I started, I've been doing it for four months, doesn't mean that I'm already a black belt. You know, I'm just kind of learning how to do these things one step at a time. And you know, as as you start learning with dogs, there's always going to be. Even now, I'm 12 years into it. I, there's still things that I saw. I'm like, I've never seen that one before. You know, and so I think that um, without sounding like the sounding like the old angry guy who's been doing this for twelve years, um, that, that just because you go to a workshop doesn't mean that you can start. Uh, not that you still can't teach it. I just think that um, knowing who your audience is and things like that. Um, you know, I, I just I just I see some of these things, and I'm just like, and I'm proud of people how they're you know advancing and stuff like that, but they're really just speaking it, actually not doing it. Out of bands. Yeah, you're right. They're, and, they and are. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of, there's a lot of talk as opposed to what the experience is. You know, I think they both have to be the experience, the hands on and the words have to be together. That art, would, would you agree that what we're seeing a lot of is I see a lot of people that know how to say the right thing before they know how to do the right thing. All and I would reverse that because once you know how to do it you'll come up with three different ways to say it yeah. but if you don't know how to do it then you're relying on the way it was explained to you and yeah. people can sense that by the way and so i think learning how to, to do something will give you more descriptive power of how to say it so think of how many students come to us and say hey i just need to learn how to say things i'm like uh, somebody said that to you well you we kind of get that a lot of people are like i just need to learn how to deliver it like you uh -huh. know people want to say the the words if it's in your bones you won't have to worry about how to say it my belief is that so it goes back to what i think aren't your yeah the subconscious you're you know it's what you're you just do it you know it's being instinctual your subconscious is being instinctual you know and so and i think it, like changing the people they have to be automatic they already have to know what they're going to do by changing their subconscious that is what instincts is for, for me. That's how I see it. You know, you have to think about it. You're too late. Yeah. All, All right, guys. guys, this was an awesome episode. Uh, I think next so. episode will be, um, what we learned from our mentors. I mean, we've kind of been talking about here, you know, a little bit and pieces of that, but I think we get, you know, can get into that. Um, you know, what you learn from, you know what, dude, let's just do a gnarly episode. Let's just, cause pe let's do like a, crazy appointment type of thing like let's talk let's do one where we just fucking light this up with crazy shit oh yes that's like we're like some real stories yeah that'd we're be all... really good actually i mean yeah. think about what the three of us could talk about and create like wh whatever you want to come up with man dude your dick got bit you talked about a scar on your dick yeah think about is i think that's dude cool let's do hear. that let's do that next episode yeah what? fuck that other stuff what do are we that. doing crazy stories oh well that's crazy a... consultations
Well, yeah. we're not trying to get the this podcast all in four podcasts, right? We no, got but what I'm saying is let's let's you know we're we're yarding on about ourselves. I, I think we need to entertain in a way with like, all right, listen, let's talk about some of the stuff we've been in, right? So when you watch a lot of these people talk and you know they got a lot of experience, it's interesting to listen because you know they're coming from all of these years of different things, like this cocktail of things. And I mean, it could be anything. Like, I mean, think of how many things you've seen. If you really start to think about it, there's appointments hiding in your brain you haven't thought of in a long time that are like, oh my God, Uh, you know what happened? Did you get bit? You know, did you... You know what I mean? Did you, did the, somebody have to take you to the hospital? Did did somebody did somebody storm out? I got an amazing one of some lady storming out and the email she sent me the next day. Oh my god, dude. It's brilliant. I'll shit, I'll find the email. <laughs> Just because it, it resonates with like how effed up it really was. So yeah, let's do that. Yeah, let's yeah. do that. I love it. All right, this is episode three of Dog Psychology Podcast. We'll see you next episode.